Hey everybody, this is the video where we cover how to get started learning AWS. Uh, I've been looking forward to this video for a long time because many of the people that I talk to are so eager to get into AWS, but they just don't know where to start. And I can't blame them. There's over 212 services offered as of today, and this is completely overwhelming if you are a beginner. Uh, so the intention of this video is to provide you with some learning direction in terms of where to begin and where you can go on your AWS journey. Afterwards, I'll mention some great resources and beginner-friendly products projects to get you started. Also, one very important point is that I'll be providing a link to this mind map down below in the comments so that you can kind of go through it at your own pace. Lots of these points are actually going to be links to videos that I've already created on some of these topics. So without blabbering on too long, let's get into it. And the first thing that I want to talk about are the fundamentals, the things that you're going to be using all across AWS pretty much from day one. And the first and what I would consider the most important one is IAM, which stands for Identity and Access Management. So IAM is basically the permissioning system that you're going to be using in AWS that says this user or this person that has this role has the permissions to access a certain resource like a database, like a machine that you have on your AWS account. You can also conversely say this person does not have the permissions to access this resource. So you're going to be using this concept regardless of where you are in AWS. If you're using things like EC2 or Elasticsearch or Lambda functions, any Anything that you're going to be using on AWS, at some point you're going to have to specify a certain permission so that you can access another resource. So I would highly, highly suggest you get familiar with IAM, how it works, understand what users are, understand what roles are, understand what permission policies are and how to attach them to users. This is really the bread and butter of AWS. It's the permissioning system. And unfortunately, if you don't spend time learning this, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to have situations where something isn't working, it's not going to be obvious why there's an error. Um, so I would highly recommend you spend the time to learn this from the get go. So the second one is uh, VPC, which stands for virtual private cloud. And back in the day before we had this cloud computing concept, we used to have on-premises networks and these networks consisted of hardware and software so that bad actors can get access to our networks. But the great thing is that you don't have to worry about any of the hardware. You just have to deal with the software elements that are related to network infrastructure. So if you don't know about VPCs, there's a couple main concepts here. Now subnets is just basically a logical subdivision of your network. Uh, so you can have multiple subnets they can be both public and private. Um, so I'd highly suggest you spend some time understanding what a subnet is, what makes it public, what makes it private. That kind of directly leads into the next point, which is internet and NAT gateways. Now, internet and NAT gateways are just means to allow your subnet to get access to the public internet or for the public internet, someone on the public internet to access one of your resources. And next there's ACLs and security groups, ACL standing for access control list and security groups. And so these are going to allow you to specify rules such as this EC2 fleet can only be accessed by a certain other resource, or this RDS instance can only be accessed by this particular Lambda function. It allows you to set up more fine grain controls over who it can and cannot access your resources. So this is the second fundamental, the VPC, that you're going to want to invest some time into before you get into the other more interesting AWS services. Uh, so now that we talked about the fundamentals, let's talk about two other ones. I wouldn't consider them fundamentals, but they're very, very important and probably think something that you're gonna be interacting with on the daily. So in the compute domain, there's two main concepts. Well, there's a couple more, but they're more advanced topics and I'm not gonna get into them in this video, but for the most part, there's EC2s and Lambdas. So EC2 stands for Elastic Cloud Compute. Uh, it's one of the older services offered in AWS. And we, we know what cloud computing is. Cloud computing is you wanna rent a server from someone, right? Well, EC2s are the machines that you rent. They are the physical machines. Some of them in some cases are virtual, but you can get physical machines if you want. Um, that you are renting from AWS to do whatever you want with. You can host a WordPress website, you can host an, a REST API, you can host an 
Elasticsearch cluster or a MySQL instance. You can do absolutely anything you want on these EC2 machines once you rent them. So you're probably gonna be using EC2s all across your journey. And if you're learning about EC2s, I recommend you learn about load balancers and auto scaling. Uh, load balancers allow you to distribute traffic over a fleet of many EC2 machines so you can maintain high availability on your application. And auto scaling is a neat feature such that you can scale up or down your fleet of EC2 machines. Maybe they're all hosting a certain application. So you can scale them up or down in response to increasing or decreasing demand on your application. This is a great way of maintaining elasticity and also keeping your costs down. Like obviously at night you don't want to have too many machines running compared to during the day. So you you can set up auto scaling on your application. And the second option is Lambdas, which are serverless. And I am actually a huge, huge fan of Lambdas. Now, what they allow you to do is to basically upload some code and run it without having to worry about servers. You don't need to worry about renting an EC2 machine or you know, its CPU utilization or sharing it with other people. All that is abstracted away from you. All you focus on is writing your code to solve your business problem upload it to Lambda, and AWS takes care of finding and provisioning your software on machines. Of course, there's gonna be a cost premium, but for certain clients, this actually may be a cheaper option. So it's worth it getting familiar with Lambdas. I can tell you personally that this is the trend, at least in 2020. Many applications are shying away from using EC2 machines and just instead relying on Lambdas just because it controls scaling for you automatically. Uh, it reduces the overhead and just makes your life a lot simpler when you're just trying to solve a business problem. Uh, so highly, highly suggest you do a little reading into Lambdas, maybe just set up a basic application to see how it works. Um, the next main component that I wanna talk about is storage. And there's three kind of main components here, which are the basics really. Uh, so there's S3, which stands for Simple Storage Service or Solution, I can't remember which of the two. But basically it's just your raw data dump. You can have very large files, you can have many very small files. Uh, it's just kind of your digital hard drive, so to speak. You can just dump your data there. It's very cost efficient. Uh, you can set up lifecycle policies such that after a period of time, if you don't use a file, it moves to an even lower cost solution, although it will have lower guaranteed availability. Uh, so it's generally your all purpose data store. It's not a database, so don't treat it as a database. It's just a place to put data, um, to store data in a cost effective way that's gonna be highly available for when you need it. Okay, so that's S3. For those of you that are coming from a relational database background, there's AWS RDS. And uh, a common question I get is why should I use RDS versus you know setting up a MySQL instance on EC2, which you can definitely do, don't get me wrong. Uh, the reason why you wanna use RDS is because it's fully managed. Uh, RDS handles taking snapshots, gathering and emitting metrics onto CloudWatch, uh, doing database backups, all the stuff that you would have to do manually if you were to host this on an EC2 machine, it's all automated for you. Uh, and there's also built-in redundancy too, which is great in case your SQL instance ever goes down. Uh, so RDS is, you're gonna be paying a little bit of a premium for the fully managed types, but in my opinion, it's worth it. That being said, you can of course do what I said before, just host a MySQL instance on an EC2. That is totally fine and that'll totally work in a lot of cases, but for more kind of scalable solutions, um, high throughput applications that require a relational database, RDS is, is probably the choice for you. Now moving on to the NoSQL world, so there's two main options here. There's DynamoDB and MongoDB. DynamoDB obviously being the solution that was built by AWS. It's your classic NoSQL key value store, uh, fully managed, you don't need to worry about any machines. All you really need to worry about is your read and write throughput. So the second option is MongoDB and MongoDB is fully managed on AWS through the service document DB. So if you see document D, that's actually referring to MongoDB. Both some very great choices, both Dynamo and Mongo. Um, it really depends on your use case and what you are more comfortable with when you're picking one. Okay, so that is it for compute and storage. So let's move on to the different trajectories that you may take through your development. Myself being a backend developer, I wanna talk about backend development and the skills that you need to know for backend development. 
So the first one that I want to talk about is the communication layer. So if you're building microservices or a service oriented architecture, first question is how are these things going to talk to each other, right? Uh, so of course you can set up some REST APIs on EC2 machines and then you know you just hard code REST endpoints and you can talk to each other that way and that'll probably work, but it's not going to scale very well. I've been there, I've done that. So don't make that mistake. Um, a, a newer service, I want to say new, but it is you know, a couple years old now is API Gateway. Now what API Gateway allows you to do is to basically build REST endpoints and back them with any infrastructure that you choose. So you can build an API Gateway that hooks into a fleet of EC2 machines that are behind a load balancer. You can hook it up to a Lambda function. You can hook it up to a Kubernetes cluster or an ECS fleet. There's so many different options here. And one of the advantages that you get in API Gateway is that you get a permissioning system. So you can say certain clients are or are not allowed to, to access a certain API. You also get throttling. So you can say certain clients are only allowed to access this API at a certain rate. And you also get some very, very rich features in terms of building all your SDKs that match the schema of the API that you define on your API gateway. So your clients, instead of having to hard code certain variable names and the schema of your REST endpoint, you just vend out a client that is handled by API Gateway to your clients, and they can just use that, that SDK, that client, to interact with your endpoints. Super, super powerful, newer service in AWS that I suggest you get familiar with. The other two here, SNS and SQS, I would actually group them together. Uh, SNS stands for Simple Notification Service. SQS stands for Simple Queue Service. So what SNS and SQS allow you to do is if I'm maybe a credit card transaction service and I want to tell other services when someone purchases something in my application, I would broadcast a message to my SNS topic where other consumers that care about that message that want to process it would subscribe their queue to. So they can get a queue that contains messages of that event and they can process it at their own rate. SNS is great as a pub sub solution. So you, you are the publisher and you have subscribers. The SQS is the subscriber in this example. Uh, so that's SNS and SQS. It's great for asynchronous communication of events across different services. Uh, so the next big one is for deployments. I have code build, code pipeline, and code deploy here. Now, if you're coming from um, a company that hasn't used AWS before, you may have your own continuous deployment or your own continuous integration pipeline. Um, these are the solutions that are offered through AWS. There's code build for building, pipeline for you know deploying to beta, gamma, whatever, and then code deploy for actually deploying your applications to many of the AWS services, including Lambda, including EC2, including ECS, all those different kind of infrastructure services. That's what you should probably know for deployment if you want to deploy using AWS technologies. The next big one is monitoring. I have CloudWatch labeled here. I kind of consider CloudWatch to be an umbrella service. Uh, and there's three main components here. So the first one is metrics. So through CloudWatch, you can actually assess the metrics that are being emitted on your Lambdas, your EC2s, whatever. Uh, so you can see how they're doing, if there's faults, latency spikes, um, error rates, low traffic time, stuff like that. You can observe these metrics through a UI. So it's got your traditional graphs where you can see all of these metrics displayed in a very nice and easy to understand way. Uh, the second important one is alarms, and that's directly tied into metrics. So if your application starts erroring out or has a high fault rate, you set up an alarm that assesses those metrics. And when it exceeds a certain value, trigger that alarm, and you can hook up that alarm to page you, email you, text you, anything you really want. Um, but it's important for maintaining an application that requires high availability. And the third one, more from a maintenance perspective or for you to understand what's happening in your application is dashboards, which CloudWatch does support. And so you can kind of construct these dashboards for a particular service or theme and say, how is this service doing? And have a whole bunch of graphs that tell you what is going on in that service. Uh, so dashboards are really neat for assessing the health of an application for you to quickly diagnose what may be going wrong in an application. 
Okay, so that's for that's it for backend development. I want to move on to frontend development. And I kind of only have a few points here, but uh, since I already kind of mentioned much of the other concepts, including EC2s, Lambdas, all that infrastructure stuff, I didn't want to repeat it here. But um, these are the ones that are very specific to frontend, but you'd be combining many of the other elements that I spoke to previously with your frontend applications. So CloudFront would be great for, um, it's a CDN essentially, a content delivery network. It supports a globally distributed network uh, with the cache content such as videos, such as you know your CSS, your HTML, your JavaScript, so that you can serve it very quickly to customers all across the globe. That's what CloudFront is for. Cognito is your permissioning system. So if you want to find certain permissions for certain users, you can do that using Cognito. And RHEL53 is your DNS and your domain name service um, solutions. So you can register for a domain name on RHEL53 and kind of link it to certain endpoints such as you know an API on your EC2 fleet. All right, so that, that's pretty much it for front-end development. Want to move on now to big data, business intelligence, maybe even a little bit of machine learning elements in here. Uh, there's three big ones that I want to talk about that I have used in the big data domain. Uh, the first one is Redshift, which is a great data warehousing solution for those of you that require you know, petabyte level scale. Uh, so you can have Redshift clusters that have multiple machines in them. So you can have very high availability, very high performance. If you have an organization that needs to perform a lot of queries that are very heavy in nature, Redshift is a fantastic solution for that. A lower cost solution that has some pitfalls associated with it is Athena. And what Athena allows you to do is query data on S3, maybe it's stored in JSON or CSV or whatever in S3. As you know, um, it's very cost effective to store your data in S3. Now using Athena, you can take advantage of a EMR cluster that performs these big data queries on your S3 data. And you just pay by the amount of data that you're reading. So it's a very cost effective way of analyzing your data. Uh, that in comparison to Redshift where you know, you're maintaining hosts, you're maintaining resources all the time, even if nobody's using your Redshift cluster. Uh, that being said, there are some problems with Athena, which I have a video on, which you should check out. Um, so it, it may not be the solution for you. The next one for big data streams and um, batching is Kinesis. There's Kinesis Streams and Kinesis Firehose. Kinesis Streams allow you to you know, put data to a stream and handle out of order events and handle time window queries and all that kind of jazz. Uh, and then there's Kinesis Firehose, which allows you to put events to a stream and then batch it into big, you know, maybe five megabyte batches with a big list of data inside of it uh, so that you can process it all at once. So that's what Kinesis is great for. So other than that, I wanted to provide you with some learning resources here. And I highly suggest if you're just starting out, to, there's a link here actually, if you check out the mind map in the description section below, but there's a great exercise that's given by AWS and it's called building a modern or build a modern web application. And it really exposes you to a lot of breadth of different AWS services that you're probably gonna be interacting with on a fairly regular basis. It really shows you what's possible on AWS and it's a, a truly fantastic exercise. And I don't believe you actually have to pay anything you use the free tier of AWS when you're building this application. So it's a great resource to get started for beginners. It's very handholdy. They show you what to do. They walk you through each step so that you shouldn't have any trouble. Highly, highly, highly suggest you checking that out if you're just getting started with AWS. Another great one that was recently announced uh, just last year in 2019 is the AWS Builder Hub. And the Builder Hub has articles that have been written by AWS staff on the complexities of maintaining AWS services and kind of they talk about certain domain problems when they're building a certain AWS service. So for instance, um, lock contention or caching problems or how to maintain high availability and uptime. Some very interesting concepts here. Um, there are different tiers. So there's beginner, intermediate and advanced. So there's um, they're designed for all audiences really. So I highly suggest you check that out if you're interested in learning more. And the final but most important one is to experiment. It's to get your hands dirty. 
You can watch hundreds of these different videos here, but ultimately at the end of the day, the way that you're gonna get better at learning AWS is by doing AWS, by going into the console, figuring out how it works, figuring out what doesn't work, and just playing with it. Um, I've been using AWS for four years. I sucked at the beginning, and um, you're probably gonna suck when you start too, but you get better over time just by doing. So that is the most important advice I can give you. Just get your hands dirty. And a great way to start out is start with an end goal. Say, I wanna host a website, or I wanna to host a REST API. Figure out how to do that. And I guarantee you, you're going to be exposed to many different AWS services and you're going to build your skill set over time. So experiment, experiment, experiment. That's what's going to make you better at AWS. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. I have many more on AWS topics on my channel. Also, please don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on next week's video. Thanks so much, folks, and I'll see you next time.